Good afternoon and welcome to this month's show. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing the government and industry leaders regarding emergency communications and public safety. With me on today's show are Rear Admiral Ron Hewitt, Assistant Director for Emergency Communications for the Department of Homeland Security's Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency. Manny Sentno, Project Manager, National Public Warning System, FEMA. Nick Nyland, Director of Product Development for Public Safety with Verizon. Lloyd Flaherty, Coordinator, National 911 Program, U.S. Department of Transportation. Tony Bardo, Assistant Vice President, Hughes Network Systems. And Adam El Eldert, Director of Communications Technology, Fairfax County Government. Well, uh, everything from uh, 911 to smart cities to FEMA effective disaster recovery, we've got to have reliable communications, and, uh, and here comes hurricane season, right? So uh, let me start with you, Ron. Um, I always like to talk about uh, just, uh, you know, give us a little state of the state as far as programs and what's going on over at the newly named CISA. Well, thanks, Luke, and uh, thanks for uh, Federal News Radio supporting public safety communications. It's going through unprecedented change with the uh, transition into uh, internet protocol networks and, and uh, enabling multimedia information to be passed to not only our citizens, but to the responders. And, and with that, uh, we've been working very closely with public safety. Uh, we have a SAFECOM, which is our advisory committee to the Department of Homeland Security to develop the National Emergency Communications Plan, which is the roadmap to achieve interoperability amongst all these public safety communication systems. Uh, we're in the process now of uh, getting that approved and uh, should be published within the next month or so. A um, lot of activity going on there and uh, super important for the timeliness of it. We're having a conversation just the other day about uh, Internet of Things, of all things, and uh, you know, half that conversation was just about the communications, right? The reliability of those communications to make all that work. Uh, Manny, as I said, it, it is hurricane season and uh, it's game on for FEMA as it always is. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on with your program over there. You have a very interesting program. Maybe you want to explain that a little bit to everyone and yes, tell us the, what's happening. We run the uh, IPAWS, which stands for Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. It is a public warning alerting uh, construct that provides uh, local governments, cities, states, and federal partners, as well as organizations, uh, the ability to warn the American public in times of emergency. One of the things that uh, we're trying to do right now is close the gap, uh, in increase the number of IPAWS users at the local level, the county level, the city level, so we can have more accurate, more timely uh, warnings to the public. In addition, is promote the idea that uh, before, during, and after disasters, communications with the public is ex of extreme importance uh, to those that are affected by those emergencies. So we're preaching about that uh, considerably. Uh, another thing is bring in additional partners such as Verizon and other pr private sector partners, disseminators, uh, new technologies, uh, the Internet of Things, so to speak, uh, to become uh, more aware and uh, become disseminators for public warning uh, around the country. Right, it's almost like a reverse 911 thing and with all these different uh, various uh, uh, disasters that are happening and, and some of these things are just, it's uh, uh, somebody really uh, disturbed mother nature it seems and uh, th there's quite a bit of activity there and I, I think it's great. It's almost like a crowdsourcing capability you know, to, to make everyone smarter. And uh, I think it's fantastic, that program. Uh, Nick, how about at Verizon? Tell us a little bit about sort of what are you all seeing out there and what's the, uh, in regards to uh, just the emergency comm activity and Verizon's role in that? Absolutely. We've been a, a major player uh, in the emergency communications field for since we've become Verizon for 19 sure. years. And uh, more first responders choose Verizon's network because of the reliability, right? Because we're in more places. And we also do things within the network to prepare for the hurricane season that's upcoming, working closely with FEMA and other agencies to make sure that we have generators at our cell sites, that we have batteries back up. But most importantly, over the course of the last two years, it's about making the network ready for first responders. 
uh, and that's the build out of our responder private core, the segmentation specifically for first responders, as well as the priority and preemption services that we launched last year, giving them first access to the network when they need it most, and even being able to remove consumers from the network if first responders need to get access. And that's not just for voice, although voice is still incredibly important, it's also for those data applications that we're talking about with IoT. So uh, those iterations, those enhancements on the network over the last two years uh, are really critical for first responders. And they really do work. I remember the, uh, the um, uh, situation that we had in Washington a, a while ago when we had that um, uh, event <clears throat> where we had to use the WPS system and, and you know, it was refreshing and encouraging to know that uh, we could uh, we could use that and it would actually work in a, you know sort of a time of need. Uh, Lori, how about at DOT? How are things going in regards to the 911 program? Super important. It seems like it's getting more and more use, and the integrity and reliability of that is is very critical. So tell us what's happening in, in that regards. Well, the program exists to do three things, to act as a convener among all of the 911 stakeholders, to collect and create resources for the folks at the state and local level that actually operate the 911 system. And we also administer a grant program specifically for 911. So we're about to award over $100 million in grants to the states to upgrade their 911 systems, which is desperately needed. You know, the first call was made over 50 years ago, and we're still operating on an infrastructure that is very old. So that's very exciting. Uh, we're, we're also working with new partners. You know, Google and Apple have, have worked with us, along with the 911 stakeholders, to figure out how to get really accurate location information to the 911 call centers. You know, we, you hear over and over again the comment, well, Uber can find me, why can't 911? So, we have worked together with them over the last year to provide supplemental location information directly from the device to the 911 call center. Imagine that, you know, I mean, if you, you look back, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the majority of the 911 calls were being made from a landline, right? And as I was talking about that, that experience in Washington uh, uh, during that earthquake, right? You know, everyone was outside the building. Everyone's trying to use their mobile device, right? right. A lot of people calling 911 right. uh, for whether it's the priority service or location. All those things really come into play and being able to modernize those environments to stitch all that together and be accurate, reliable, and dependable, really critical, right? And it's I mean, it's, it's both of those things. It's not only upgrading the system, but that enables them to be stitched together. In, in, the, in the old system, there was no tech no way technologically for the 911 call centers to connect to each other, which really created limitations. They all had to be independent operations. Now, with this new infrastructure, they are able to connect to each other, transfer calls to each other, which is really important in terms of resilience. I'll, just one example, during Hurricane Katrina, there were 38 of those call centers that were taken completely out of operation, yeah. and those calls went nowhere. Uh, if you fast forward to Hurricane Irene, uh, the state of Vermont had that infrastructure in place, and during one of their highest call volumes ever, they, they closed at least one of their call centers, and no one in the state knew the difference. It's fantastic, it right? Works. I mean, where this digital technology allows you to do that, but very important, glad to hear about the grants, because it's, uh, you know, uh, it's great to have this digital technology, but you have to be able to have the, the funding to invest in these capabilities. Tony, how about over at HUGE? I know you guys are, are, are very uh, big in this capability as far as uh, emergency comms, et cetera, and you've been around a long time as a company. Tell us what's happening at HUGE. Well, the, the, thing, the important thing to, to discuss here for me would be the, the theme of um, variable communications technologies working together um, to really form the resiliency that we all seek in, in terms of emergency preparedness and emergency response. And, and along with that would be the theme of path diversity. Uh, certainly, terrific networks exist at the federal, state, and local level. They're probably in the, in the process of being improved with some of the new programs going on. But the, the idea of single-threadedness is really a, a, a critical thing to fix and to repair and to fund in terms of how to, how to move this whole uh, realm of, of communications of capability during times of, of need. 
And that's, that's where we, we fit in. We, we do not purport to be the entire solution and fit. Sure. But we're there with, with particularly rapid responsiveness to set up communications in a place where that's been comp- compromised. You can never figure out where a disaster is going to hit. I mean, you can have some ideas, uh, you know, the coasts, the islands, and so forth. Um, but the, the idea of setting up resiliency in an agency's network, in an enterprise, commercial enterprise's network, whereby you've got two paths out, at least two paths out. Um, we've been seeing a little bit of this activity in the NG911 um, environment, whereby the, um, the local governments are and the states are establishing dual and maybe sometimes tertiary paths out, which ensure at the fixed sites that the government can still serve in a time of need, can still operate, keep the lights on, keep the communications going. Uh, in terms of mobile communications, Nick's company, Verizon, has a, num- has a fleet of, of vehicles that, that, that you know, mobilize quickly and, and, and add that agility and, and mobility to, to the equation. Uh, they are equipped with path diverse. They, they've got uh, cellular, the, 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 the 4G, the 5G, the LTE, as well as satellite capability. So not so much a product pitch, but a pitch for using the whole ecosystem of, of the things that we need as a community, as a nation, to get the job done in a in, Sure, in a time and of especially calamity. in a time of need yep. when, uh, you know, the, the, the public is leaning on uh, the federal uh, service to, to be there, so to speak. And uh, yes, it's a, it's a disturbing feeling. I think we, we learned that from, uh, uh, from Katrina even prior to that, you know, that some of these single path type things uh, were, uh, cost us a lot of challenges. Uh, Ron and I both uh, went through that. Uh, so um, uh, having that redundancy, that reliability, that, that uh, you know, dual path type capability, super important. Adam, how about at Fairfax County? You guys are a very progressive county. You're right in the mix. You're, you're, you're sort of right on the edge of Washington there, so you get sort of mixed up in all that, but then you have all the, uh, all the other goodies and accoutrements that go along with uh, a major national municipality, so to speak. Uh, tell us what's happening in regards to emergency communication preparedness well, at Fairfax County. <clears throat> Uh, most of my counterparts here pretty much stolen all my thunder. Well, that's okay. <laughs> uh, no, really, uh, some of the things that we're doing at Fairfax is uh, we're continuing moving down the road of a lot of uh, uh, communications interoperability with uh, broadband push to talk uh, functionality th- with uh, FirstNet and interoperate, uh, interoperable communications with our LMR systems, um, working regionally with uh, our other constituent, uh, you know, the jurisdictions. Uh, adjacent to us with inner subsystem interfaces. So essentially what that's going to do is uh, be able to allow responders to traverse through other jurisdictions while still being able to talk to their their own dispatcher, uh, giving that ability to extend their footprint beyond the the confines of the county, which is uh, a very big importance because our mutual aid agreements, especially in fire and rescue, uh, are all over uh, Northern Virginia, D.C., and Southern Maryland. So that really makes a big difference, uh, being able to do that. Right, and your ability to, to, to converge onto an environment, whether it's in the county or, or outside, as you described, this is a reality, right, of, of the way we're facing. And the comms have to be there, right? I mean, that's just a, a fact. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's swing over to uh, a specific program. Manny, I'm going to start with you. And let's talk about a specific program that's making a big impact in regards to... Uh, what you guys are working on. One of the things we're doing uh, is uh, modernizing the National Public Warning System. WFED, WTOP are members of the National Public Warning System right. through the Primary Entry Point Program. Uh, we have other stations in the National Capital Region as mm-hmm. well, including uh, WBAL in Baltimore, AM, and WRXL FM in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia. We have 77 sites around the country. Uh, about 40 of those sites have uh, uh, an HEMP, high altitude electromagnetic pulse protection. They all have, uh, they're all power resilient. Uh, our new facilities that we're building out to modernize the original uh, PEP stations in the program are going to get an all hazards protective approach uh, so that they can survive and become resilient 
in their areas of operation. One of the most important things uh, that we, uh, projects that we have under IPAWS in FEMA is making sure that the public is fully informed under all conditions. The IPAWS Modernization Act of 2015 states that the president must be able to communicate with the American public under all conditions. That construct is also made available to the local and state governments so that they can communicate with the public in their areas. Uh, so these stations are very important in, in the immediate aftermath of, of a major emergency. We have seen uh, that uh, evidence of that in, uh, after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. We've seen that in uh, the, the Sandy uh, events. We've seen that just as recently as 2017 uh, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands where these NPWS facilities remain on the air providing uh, that, that critical information to the public. In doing so, we're also training uh, local and state authorities and uh, folks like the National Guard to man those facilities if the radio station uh, personnel were unavailable to do so, so that uh, information could be funneled from one point to many. Uh, broadcast, in our opinion, is a backbone uh, to reach the masses. It's a light it's, it's one to many. Uh, of course, if we can uh, use uh, mobile phones and other means, uh, that definitely we should use those. But after a major catastrophe, it's important to be able to communicate with the public. And everybody has a radio somewhere around them. Including and and they vehicles. lean on it in a time of need. And it's reassuring to know that there's not only, uh, uh, you know, dual capabilities, but triple capabilities and all types of hazards and all types of uh, scenarios. That's uh, great to hear that. Uh, Nick, how about at Verizon? Can you give us an example of a specific program that you guys are working on that you'd like to point out? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the, the areas that we're most proud of, I talked about our responder core and our priority services, but the, all that started with wireless priority service. And you mentioned how important that program is yourself. In times of disaster, in times of network congestion, being able to have a national level program administered by a trusted federal agency uh, that is uh, enabled by the carriers uh, in wireless priority service gives priority service and preemption to our first responders available mm -hmm. at no charge to to users but it, what I think it's most important is it gives choice to first responders both for their agency communications as well as for their personal communications if the agency does not offer them a phone they can become wireless priority service users and subscribers uh, at no charge and get that front of line access, that immediate access to the network when they need it. And we're incredibly proud to be able to support the wireless priority service program in addition to uh, building it on top of the backbone of the most reliable network. And so uh, Tony mentioned uh, the network upgrades that have happened to enable uh, more resilient, redundant communication pathways. And all of that coming together to offer priority service for it's first responders. It's great to hear, and when you need it, you sure do need it. Ron, how about at DHS? Can you give us a specific program that you'd like to point out? Yeah, thanks, Luke. And one of the, the key points that we've all been talking about is the change of, of communications being used by public safety. In the past, it was primarily land mobile radio, which right. was the uh, voice communications. But now with broadband, that's provided by Verizon, Hughes, and others. Uh, they, we now have to be able to ensure the responders have the ability to know how to use that equipment. And so with that, uh, we've been working with public safety to create a uh, information technology services leader, uh, which is part of the National Incident Management System, the Incident Command System structure, which is the way they f organize and to uh, process different incident responses. And so with that, this new information technology services leader will help be able to ensure that all these broadband capabilities, satellite, uh, uh, cellular capabilities are going to be able to be used uh, to the best of the ability to be able to ensure that you have data, icon, and, and, uh, and cybersecurity, and all those aspects that you have to be able to take into account when working with uh, uh, these types of networks and all mesh together when you need it right and I think Correct. that's really important whether it's you know sort of a, on a sunny day or a, on a bad day let's call it uh, well we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back you're listening to the federal executive forum on federal news radio part of the federal news network welcome back to the federal executive forum on federal news radio part of the federal news network 
We're talking about emergency communications, and with me on today's show are Rear Admiral Ron Hewitt with CISA, Manny Centen Centino with FEMA, Nick Nyland with Verizon, Lori Flattery with Department of Transportation, Tony Bardo with Hughes Network Systems, and Adam Eldert with Fairfax County. We were talking about specific programs. Lori, let me throw it over to you at Department of Transportation. Can you tell us about a specific program that you guys are working on maybe in the 911 area? Sure. As you said, it, it's really important that this whole ecosystem be meshed together. So we're really focus on, focusing on interoperability and interconnection, uh, both in terms of the, really, the good work that is happening on the 911 side as well as for the emergency responders with the public safety broadband network. How is that going to be interconnected? You know, how is the photograph of whatever it is going to go from the citizen through 911 and on to the emergency responders. Figuring that out is really important and trying to make sure that all the right people are talking to each other is, is incredibly important to make sure that happens. We're also working with our federal partners because there are hundreds of 911 call centers that are operated by the Department of Defense and the Park Service. and they are really challenged in terms of upgrading their technology to be on the same platform as everyone else. And if they're not, they're not going to be able to communicate with, with the civilian world. So we're trying to provide them the resources they need to make the business case to upgrade their systems as well. Yeah, I would imagine that the uh, sort of diversity of this uh, 911 coverage all over the country and tribal areas and on the border and in the parklands and, and you raise some good points there. And also the emergence of all this different technology that people want to use to be able to, uh, to, to, to you know, to, uh, I guess, sort of perform a 911 call. Mm -hmm. Whether it's mobile or next thing you know, it'll be on some device that we're not even thinking about. Right. It's really incredible. Yeah, I think, but once, you know, everyone is on the same platform, mm -hmm. is everyone's using the same infrastructure, a lot of things become possible. But then a lot more questions are raised about exactly how is that interconnection going to work? And of course, who are the right people that need to be talking to each other to make sure that those things happen? Sure, and, and you know, uh, Adam, you were talking about a moment ago, you know, sort of, you know, uh, coming outside of your county. And I know that when you kind of digitize all these environments, right, all of a sudden there's a lot more capability technologically to expand some of these, uh, these abilities into the responders' hands. Uh, give us an example of maybe some of the projects that you're working on. We talked about a couple prior to the show uh, that you want to highlight. All right, well, we were... Um one of the things that I indicated before is our integration with uh, FirstNet and uh, the public safety responder network with uh, a land mobile radio. Uh, and also uh, with all the, the new different types of applications and functions and features available to first responders. Uh, for instance, uh, for X, Y, and Z access location uh, for firefighters, uh, be able to identify uh, where they are in a building, uh, be able to try and push additional data from advanced HUD sensors back out to, to the command vehicle on large incidents. Uh, our, our police department with regards to in-car video and uh, body-worn cameras that are, were being field tested. Uh, all, these different all these different data streams have to go someplace. Right now a lot of these things are stored locally and then uploaded at a wireless access point, but we're trying to move forward with uh, as needed on demand if you are in a high uh, high stress situation like a barricaded suspect to be able to try and take that on-demand video and push it up to Central Command Center so that uh, the, these on-scene commanders have uh, 360 degree views of what exactly is going on on the ground from the responders in the, in the immediate vicinity. Yeah, and I know it's a, a big part of this. It's uh, sort of when we talk about coverage was always a big issue, right, on the border, et cetera. But it's also coverage into a building, right? And BMLE is one of the things that we learned on 9-11, right? It's a real challenge. And then we get into not only just to being able to communicate, you know, via voice, it's having the communications in regards to the data, right? And making sure that that's reliable and, 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 and redundant and the capability is there in regards to any kind of situation. Um, Tony, how about at Hughes? You were talking about sort of, the, look, you guys are sort of the backbone there, right? 
Tell us a little bit about uh, maybe a specific program that you all are working on that of, uh, you want to highlight here. Happy to, Luke. Um, the, we were called upon to serve and, and, and we're honored to serve uh, FEMA during two of the most, most prominent in recent memory um, hurricane uh, disasters or superstorm disasters, if you want to correctly uh, uh, annotate uh, Sandy. Seems like they're all but, super storms yes, these days, yes. right? I mean, it's amazing uh, what's happening. Sandy yeah. was the perfect storm, if you will, of, yeah. of, of a lot of uh, factors and a lot of issues. But uh, what what happened was our ability to deploy quickly to, in, in this case, in the case of both uh, um, New York, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands more recently, was the ability to serve uh, disaster recovery centers. And in, in uh, New York, it was interesting to see all these FEMA folks that, that, that serve and come in as, as a result of, of, of a need. Sure. Uh, and they said, yeah, glad you're here. You'll be here a couple of days. Um, you know, this will re really be a big help to us. We were there for six months. In Puerto Rico, the big problem was getting our gear on the island, getting uh, our installers to the island getting them transportation, getting them uh, deployed throughout the island and, and as well as on the Virgin Islands. We're still there today. However long ago that happened in Puerto Rico, a couple of years now almost, um, we're still there today sort of solving the problem of some broken still infrastructure and broken communication links and so forth. And, and um, you know, we're, we're, we've, we've got Preparations going on right now and discussions with FEMA on, on how to be ready for it again. Um, we never did want to bring our gear back to the mainland because we'd sure. solve those problems again. So where to store the gear? In some places, in some cases, uh, the gear is still active and systems and, and services are still being rendered. So the the we're, we're proud of that. We we but you know getting back to the idea of, well, you can't tell where you're going to set up a, a, a disaster recovery center, where you're going to set up tents and so forth. That problem will always exist. And companies like Verizon and ourselves are, are always ready to move wherever we need to be. The idea of path diversity and re, 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 redundancy in the network at fixed locations, at critical government agencies, federal, state, and local, that provide direct constituent service. That's where funding needs to be. So sure, and I yeah. And, and, and if I may, just um, uh, uh, it reminds me of the the saying of a you know sort of an ounce of prevention, right? Uh, we'll, 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 so that that's really important as well. And I know it's something that FEMA spends a lot of time on in the preparedness side of things as well. Uh, I'd like to switch it over and talk about lessons learned. This is a good segue into that. Manny, we're going to start with you. I know that FEMA always does a hot wash on every disaster that they have. They've learned as we've evolved uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, right? And uh, why don't you talk a little bit about some lessons learned that FEMA has discovered that you'd like to share with the audience as they're thinking through you know, their response capability, their preparedness capability. FEMA is always ready to respond uh, to these emergencies by pre-staging. And they're doing a brilliant job, by the way. I want <laughs> to point you. that out. Uh, pre-staging uh, training of, of state and local personnel uh, to respond and recover uh, faster. One of the things that I believe we need all to improve in, especially at the local and state level, is once again, that communication with the public. Uh, a community that is informed recovers faster. That is uh, a true statement, and, and we all need to recognize and understand that. So on a blue sky, sunny day, we can use all of our, of our smart technologies, smart speaker systems, the internet, uh, and all of those things that, that work well and we have embraced so well in, 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 uh, in our culture. After a disaster, a lot of those things don't work very well, but we still need to communicate with the community and those survivors. Uh, and that's why we run the programs that we run. That's why we, we offer uh, the, the thoughts and, and uh, the, the actions of resilience, right? So, right of readiness, uh, power resiliency, communications resiliency, human resiliency. 
uh, folks can't work if they're taking care of their families, if they are survivors themselves and are terribly affected by emergencies. So you've got to be able to bring in surge uh, uh, components into a disaster area or have additional local uh, human resources in those areas. Uh, better partnerships and pre-agreements with other government agencies and private sector partners so that you're ready to react, you're ready to uh, respond to any of these emergencies, mutual aid packs. Uh, one of the things that we offer uh, as, as strong suggestions, testing and exercises. Mm. Uh, folks at the state and local levels often don't do enough of that. That includes communications. Uh, just because it works today doesn't mean it'll work tomorrow. Doesn't mean it will work under uh, the conditions that, that you are now facing in an emergency. Uh, when I talk about power resiliency, I always preach a bit about fuel, servicing those generators, mm -hmm. making sure that things continue to operate. If you have no power, you are out of business. And I tell you, and it's these small details. I and mean, we used to test and retest, and you know the the folks would get so frustrated at these small things. And we'd always say, "Hey, this is when we want to find out these things." Yes, they were minor things, and and yes, we didn't think about them. But now we've learned and discovered, and we've prepared for that. And so when the uh, when the day comes, we're ready to go. Uh, Adam, how about at uh, Fairfax County? I know you guys are doing a lot of different activities over there. How about some lessons learned that maybe some of the audience that are out there in the different municipalities, et cetera, are, are uh, listening in would want to hear about some of the things that you've discovered, uh, you know, maybe on the plus side, maybe on the minus side that you'd like to point out? Well, one of the things that we've done at Fairfax, because we, we do tend to lead a lot of uh, jurisdictions in technology right. and advancements, especially in the realm of communications. And one of the things that we've, we've seen to come up a lot with is everybody's got their own flavor uh, from a manufacturer standpoint, a special mm -hmm. sauce they put in there. Sure. And so it's not necessarily standards-based. And we, we're really driving for standards-based uh, infrastructure because then it really doesn't matter what brand that you select to use through whatever procurement process, if it's a standard ba standards-based uh, development of products, then you can have uh, not only uh, other jurisdictions that may not be able to afford the Cadillac of communication systems, but maybe something in the line of you know the mid middle ground, or maybe some people can't afford that. So if we have a standards-based infrastructure where everybody can work and play together well, then it'll lead, it makes for better interoperable communications, uh, and, and not just radio, but I'm talking about like uh, broadband uh, technologies, so radio over IP, or any kind of other interfaces where we can push data streams for critical incidents or first responders, uh, for emergency management professionals. Having standards based, really, uh, I can't speak enough about it because we've learned a lot because having to have some sort of less than adequate middleware or something else to kind of glue sure. these things together uh, are the things that really uh, help make things easier and better to do and quicker, especially in a state of emergency uh, where you have a number of jurisdictions coming together, they may not be able to shop at the same store. Right, and in a time of need, you just want this stuff to work. I remember 20 years ago, we all remember 20 years ago, just trying to port your, your cell number from one carrier to another was almost impossible. Now, you know, you can do it uh, over the air. So, Nick, um, why don't we throw it over to you in regards to lessons learned, and maybe you can respond to the standards issue, and, uh, and just talk about, you know, sort of... Um, as you all are, are rolling out these different capabilities, 5G, et cetera, what are the lessons learned that people need to be thinking about? Yeah, I completely agree with my fellow panelists here. Um, what we've learned over the course of the last uh, years <coughs> in deploying to incidents and uh, disasters is uh, the uh, responsibility of our Verizon response team to have generators ready, to have uh, cells on wheels, deployable network units that can restore the network as quickly as possible. But more recently, as more cities have evolved to be smart cities mm -hmm. and more critical infrastructure has been upgraded to do real-time monitoring of critical infrastructure, we've realized that public safety communications is uh, a piece of the puzzle, especially when it comes to restoring connectivity and restoring situational awareness uh, across a disaster area. And so uh, I completely agree with what Adam was saying. Uh, it's about having these systems work together, both in the public safety sphere, but then outside of that to understand what's going on 
uh, across the civilian community of how the citizens are responding to this disaster and how critical infrastructure can be brought back online as quickly as possible. Industry wants to share this information. Uh, they need to do it in a safe and secure way. And so being able to find those interoperable standards and those communication means is incredibly important. That's what we're working on now. Right, just have that, that basic fundamental capability there. Uh, Lori, how about over at the 911 program? I'm sure you have a lot of lessons learned as you've, you've looked to roll this capability out, mature it to a higher order. Uh, any you'd like to share with us? Well, one, one of the things that I really enjoy about the program is that a lot of the resources that we create are as a result of the, their identification by the stakeholders. Um, and as they de de develop their own systems, they want to share their own experiences. One example uh, of a project that we currently have going on is uh, we're supporting four states in the upper Midwest who are at a point with their own 911 systems where they're starting to think about how they interconnect with the surrounding states. Because with this new technology, it becomes possible for me to transfer calls to you and to a third party and back again. And how exactly is that going to work? And, and you know, the technology, frankly, is the easy part. Trying to figure out who needs to be talking to whom and you know who's in charge and who's going to pay for it gets really interesting. But it's been fascinating to watch them work through those issues. And we have developed, developed a series of documents we're calling the Interstate Playbook. And there are states in New England and in the Southwest there that are recreating that process using those documents. So that's one example of you know, sort of a resource that we've been able to provide that seems to have been very helpful. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, oftentimes and maybe sometimes not oftentimes, the technology does get in front of some of these things. And, and all of a sudden you realize, hey, I've got some policy issues because I can transfer these calls to another jurisdiction, but that's a 911 call, right? And I have to be able to make sure that that person can, is prepared to deal with something that's in a different jurisdiction and thinking through all that. You know, you can throw those calls around, so to speak, but... Uh, making sure that everyone's ready to go, they're trained, et cetera, is probably a big deal. Yeah, we also have a, a pilot that we're starting in the state of Washington where uh, the 911 network there is interested in interconnecting with the military installations. And that is yet another different kind of challenge. So again, we're going to provide them the resources to, for the logistics as well as producing a document because every state is going to want to get their hands on that playbook. Fascinating lesson learned. Well, we're going to be right back in just a minute. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News with Network. With me on today's show are Rear Admiral Ron Hewitt with CISA, Manny Centino with FEMA, Nick Nylan with Verizon, Lori Flattery with Department of Transportation, Tony Bardo with Hughes Network Systems and Adam Eldert with Fairfax County. We were talking about lessons learned. Ron, let me throw it over to you. I know you have a, a tremendous amount of lessons learned, uh, the, but just point out maybe a couple on the plus side or the minus side that uh, you know we ought to be thinking about as we, uh, we, we all go on this journey. Well, key one, public safety works in life and death situations every day, and we have to be understanding of that. Uh, the technology as we look to uh, to provide them to enable them to do their jobs better that work in in a commercial environment may not work in a public safety environment in particular uh, when you walk around now you see everybody's head buried in their cell phone well that doesn't work if you're a, a police officer and you have someone apprehended the last thing you want to do is lose sight of that that person so it's it's really important that you understand uh, when you're deploying new applications and stuff you understand the mission that you're trying to solve that for. A firefighter, they have a breathing apparatus, they have gloves on and everything. So, you know, that, that uh, device that we use, you know, hands, you know, pretty much they have to be able to do it hands free. So it, it is critical because you only usually get one chance. If they try it and it doesn't help them, they're very reluctant to go back and, and uh, adopt it later. So it, it's critical you understand their mission and it's user friendly. Right, and, uh, and simple, right, in a time of need, you know. Uh, a lot of times they only have one chance, right, depending right. on the situation they're in, or maybe they have big gloves on or what have you. And uh, I think we all learned that, uh, you know, getting some of these prototypes out into the field 
in the operator's hands, you can almost instantly get feedback on, is this a non-starter, is this gonna work, and it just needs a couple of iterations, right? I mean, that's just the reality of, of what we're facing these days. Uh, Tony, how about at uh, Hughes? I'm sure you've got a lot of lessons learned. You sort of talked about that uh, on, uh, w with uh, the different uh, disasters and with Sandy and with Puerto Rico, et cetera. Maybe another specific example of some lessons learned on the plus side or the minus side that uh, anybody would want to hear about and think about and learn from. On the plus side, um, Luke, the, the, uh, the idea of using uh, communications such as satellite, FEMA's been using that for a long time. The, the great lesson learned is, is that as we have now adopted over the past 20 years broadband satellite technology, the speeds are improving. And speed is king in terms of bandwidth capacity, in terms of using bandwidth hungry applications at the disaster recovery centers, is the idea that we can do more, we can add voice in. We did that at Sandy. The various satellites we've used, what we used back in, in 2012 during Sandy was two meg up and 15 down service. That was an improvement already over some of the fixed satellite services they were using, transponder satellite services that they were using. Fast forward to, um, to Puerto Rico, we added another high throughput satellite to the network. And in Puerto Rico and, Vir and the Virgin Islands, we were offering three meg up and 25 meg down. Such much greater capacity. And I think if we get the notion, the, the lessons learned moving forward, the good news is as these agencies start, start to think about, yeah, that old, slow, and expensive satellite, you know, it's not for us. Well, it's now cheaper, faster, and quicker to deploy, and, and um, um, more, more uh, resilient and able to conduct and transact the business that the agencies need. And Incredible in what's happening with the whole low orbit satellite capability and constellation of these activities that are going on there is gonna you know, put a footprint all over the globe. Well, let's uh, pivot over to um, major challenges. We're gonna try to do a quick turbo round before we, we wrap up with sort of painting the future. Lori, I'm gonna ask you, what top, top challenge that you're facing today? Well, you know, the public calls 911 more than 240 million times a year. Wow, and it, a it year. Ha it has to work. Um, and there's this, you know, saying that, you know, it's not, not good enough if it works 99% of the time, it has to work five nines, you know, 99.99% of the time. Um, and that, you know, trying to figure out exactly how that is going to be maintained with this new infrastructure is a challenge. Um, particularly with regard to cybersecurity, because you know we've talked about the Internet of Things. We, you have to balance access with security, and if if either one of those things wins, everybody loses. So trying to figure out where the line is between you know allowing maximum access and maintaining security in this new world of you know digital and internet-based model uh, technology is going to be a real challenge. Super delicate, uh, you know, situation there, and it's got to be there. Um, all right, we're gonna we're gonna go uh, down to the end, and Adam, we're gonna start with you, and uh, ask you to sort of tell us what the future looks like. You know, if I'm a citizen in Fairfax County, or I'm on the outside of Fairfax County, uh, what's my experience? What does Fairfax County look like? from an emergency responder, smart city, and uh, two or three years? Well, right now, uh, like I said, everybody's talking about broadband, right? So uh, the enhancement of broadband services throughout the county and the region. Um, Fairfax County just got approved to start a drone program for emergency management, so wow. I'm on a steering committee for that. So mm -hmm. that's going to be another thing that we're going to be seeing, how we can better employ drones for situational awareness, uh, for dealing with disaster, of being able to get that big picture view. Uh, also, what are the first responders as well? Uh, and as well as uh, smart cities, uh, trying to get in-building communication standards pushed through so that we can have better opportunities for uh, first responders to be able to communicate not only with voice but also with data throughout uh, a lot of the area. So it's a little slow process. I know I've been beating that drum for 10 years to try to push forward, so I'm hoping that now with these needed response, these other requirements that we're going to be able to get some traction to really make that an effort to help first responders. And your number one challenge is my number one challenge right now 
uh, aside from procurement policies that are really overly cumbersome for first responders. Ah, uh, it's not just in the federal government, no, folks, no, right? That would be my first, yeah. that would be one of the biggest things sure. I'm facing right now. Yep, that's a whole nother panel. Tony, <laughs> uh, tell us what the future looks like in regards to Hughes. Uh, the future is exciting. Um, the, the great speeds that I mentioned about that we delivered in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands are going to be uh, further enhanced with the launch of a new satellite in 2020, whereby we will see speeds of two, three, four times what we've been delivering lately. So that's going to improve things for the agencies that, that adopt. 2020 being next year. Yes. Okay. So the, the, um, the idea of, of funding and adoption and awareness of using the mix of technologies that are now much more available to replace aging, older, and slower, and expensive systems, um, like with everything else, things are getting faster and cheaper. And so I think what you'll see is agencies being able to have more capability through satellite services for public safety and emergency response at lower rates. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, faster, um, uh, less expensive, and I would imagine the reliability is going to be significant with this mesh of a constellation yes. of capabilities out there as Indeed. well, right? Indeed. That's fantastic. Exciting news. Lori, how about at Department of Transportation? Uh, what does the future of 911 look like? Oh. God, I can't wait to hear the answer. <laughs> I really, you know. When I think about the future, I think about yeah. back to the future, frankly. Right. I mean, you know, it's, the system's over 50 years old, and it's a tool. Ultimately, it's a tool to help the person calling for help. Um, so when I think about the future, I think about beginning with the end in mind. Uh, what, what do law enforcement, fire, and emergency medical services need in order to answer that call and work our way backwards to make sure that we're getting that information from the caller and able to transmit it onto the emergency responders? Figuring out that technology is, is already happening Trying to figure out the relationships among all the, um, the parties that need to pull that off is going to be even more challenging, but it's happening. So it's a very exciting time. And it seems to me that, um, you know, with these, again, this capability to, to have redundant uh, types of environments where you can call into a jurisdiction, and if it's overwhelmed or offline, it goes to another jurisdiction. Sort of the next evolution of that is uh, more informed, right? Where it's not just location, but there's all kinds of other information yeah. about maybe the building that they're in and these sort of things right. that I'm reading about where it's, it's so when that responder shows up there, they have a lot of information. Right. Uh, then they're much more prepared to be able to attack the situation, whatever it is, right? Absolutely. Um, which sounds great. Number one challenge for you. Well, I... My constituents tell me that governance and funding are probably their two biggest challenges. Wow. Um, okay. Um, a consistent theme there. <laughs> Nick, uh, tell us what the, uh, the future looks like in regards to Verizon. If I'm looking over the, uh, uh, the horizon, so to speak, uh, and I'm just, uh, whether I'm Johnny Citizen or I'm, you know, uh, Susie First Responder, uh, what, 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 what does that look like in two to three years? Yeah, absolutely. In the what very does it look near, like in five years? Absolutely. So in the very near term, what we're really focused on is the health and safety of officers, understanding what they go into when they go into a disaster, into a scenario, and leveraging IoT or leveraging the devices they're already bringing with them uh, to take advantage of the new 4G LTE networks that are being deployed with NB-IoT and CAT-M, but things as simple as understanding when an officer draws their weapon or understanding when... They have a uh, smartwatch and they have an accelerated heart rate. So these little things that are already available today that are just going to see broader adoption. Uh, a little further out, though, what we're really excited about is making the uh, first responders more efficient in operations. And so leveraging the new networks that are going to be deployed with 5G. We have two cities online already in Chicago and Minneapolis, and we're working with law enforcement and public safety in those cities to better understand what you could do with uh, a gig per second in your hand uh, on the downlink. What you could do with mobile or multi-access edge computing, if I can put compute and analytics in the network and give you under 10 millisecond latency, what could I do in terms of better situational awareness? Uh, certainly location of my officers and my first responders, but location of everything in a city. And so that's what we're really excited about. It's that broader situational awareness to allow for better operational efficiency 
for all first responders based on these new networks that we're rolling out. And yeah, and I would imagine some of that newer technology. We heard about, you know, sort of these constellations and low orbiting satellites that is just going to sort of explode with capability. I would imagine I, we're hearing about 5G now. And, you know, well, what does 5G mean? Well, what is that going to do in regards to, uh, you know, whether it's the, the average citizen or the... Uh, you know, the first responder, what does that mean to them? In the short term, it's going to be an improvement on current capabilities. Right now, I have some surveillance video on my network. I have body-worn cameras, but a lot of that is not really at the point of need. It's not at the time of need. It's a lot of offloading later. So if I can give you live situational awareness, a live video feed, uh, even in high definition uh, from a drone or from a body-worn camera, from a dash camera uh, in a vehicle, I'm gonna give you much better situational awareness. In the long term, though, we honestly don't know what 5G is going to enable, and that's what we're really excited about. When we launched 4G in 2010, we didn't know things like Uber and Lyft were going to be things. So we're at the point right now where 5G is uh, open sky, blue sky, and so we're investing in this community. We have 15 companies that we're investing in this year in our 5G first responder lab that are coming in and getting access to this technology that came out of public safety, that came out of first responders, that came out of the Department of Defense. And now they're being able to put their innovations and their technology to use on 5G, and we're building the future together. And that's really neat to hear that you almost don't know, and you do think about Uber and Lyft and, and Airbnb, and they, they just sort of use those mesh of technology platforms to just sort of bring in a new capability that nobody even thought about, right, with that's these right. different devices that are in your hand. And, and we want the next generation of innovations to come to benefit first responders. 100%, Manny. Uh, what does the future look like in regards to FEMA and maybe specifically your program? And what can one expect when we have yet another disaster, which undoubtedly we will, right? Uh, what's it look like? You We're know, currently you... working with the mobile carriers, with the Federal Communications Commission, uh, to improve uh, alerting. Uh, we're going from 90 characters 300 to 360 characters on the wireless emergency alerts, which is a program that uh, FEMA IPOS runs with the FCC. Uh, in increasing the accuracy of geolocation so that uh, we don't over alert uh, the public. Uh, we're working on closing that gap, getting more uh, states, counties, and localities to utilize IPAWS, the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, and doing better training, doing better exercising, modernizing the NPWS PEP stations, creating more resiliency in our systems adding uh, more uh, disseminators such as smart speakers, such as uh, iPods compatible siren systems, which is a, 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 a concept that we actually worked out in Puerto Rico after hurricanes Irma and Maria, so that there's more actionable information coming over giant voice systems and sirens. Uh, using all technologies to, to get that information to the public, not just as an emergency alert system or wireless e emergency alert, on radio, television, and, and your mobile phone, but also during and after an emergency, that long form programming, uh, teaching, uh, training uh, localities and states to provide more actionable information to the public, not wait till the five o'clock news conference to provide that, provide that on an hourly basis so these folks can be better prepared to protect their families. Right, and, and I, yeah, I've sort of, uh, you say during and, and after and certainly before, right? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, with the predictive capability that we have now through NOAA, et cetera, we know when these things are coming. We don't know exactly how it's going to go down, but in many cases, uh, we have good indications of that, and we can really sort of set the table, right, and be ready for uh, for any kind of scenario that may happen. You're always going to have a sandy kind of thing that, you know, you just have to play pickup basketball and start dealing with it. Uh, but uh, I think preparedness is a big part of this. Yes. Uh, Ron, what does the future look like? You're involved in a lot of these different capabilities at a national level and stitching together all these uh, local and, and national capabilities. What's the future look like out three years from now? Well, today we take for granted the ability to send pictures, videos to anyone we want to. But that doesn't exist right now in 911. Uh, in fact, in most areas... Yeah, this uh, is sort of... A they enhanced 911, please. Right, and so in most areas, right now, they're just now uh, getting to text and being able to text 911. But, you know, if we continue on the track, we're able to, uh, going to be able to uh, provide the, the capability. So if you have a lost child or whatever, you can send that picture or video clip in to the 911 center. 
That broadband capability now is also going to be extended out to responders. We'll be able to connect links into uh, iPods to be able to let citizens help and, and to be able to have a more interconnected uh, capability so that we can have multimedia information in a public safety environment to be able to keep our citizens and responders safe. You know, but the biggest issue we run into in, in terms of uh, trying to achieve that is public safety is very decentralized, unfortunately. They each have their own budgets and they each have their own acquisition processes. So uh, we're, we're trying to, as, as uh, Lori alluded to, having that governance, you don't want to be exchanging business cards at the event. You've got to be doing that ahead of time. And so the more we can do that, uh, we're going to have a much safer environment in the future. And it's gotten a lot better, and I'm sure it'll continue to do so. I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this program. I'd like to thank our sponsors for Without. We don't have a show. I'd like to thank the good news people here at Federal News Radio that make our program so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank you, the listening audience, that tune in every month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network.